I've been wanting to review Divinity Original Sin 2 for quite some time now, but wanted to cover the series leading up to this. Seeing what Divinity started out to what it would end up becoming is truly heartwarming. Larian went through so many ups and downs, including the death of longtime series composer Kirill Petrovsky during the development of the first Original Sin. Unfortunately, I've been stuck with Divinity 2, Ego Draconis, and haven't been able to get very far in it due to simply not enjoying it very much. So instead, I decided to review Divinity Original Original Sin 1 and quickly give a recap of the games before as a bit of a compromise. Divine Divinity came out in the ancient year of 200, I mean 2002, and it was a moderate success for the time. It was often compared to Diablo, but heavily stood out on its own with many elements taken from CRPGs of the time. It also had a ton of environmental interactivity, a beautiful score, nice graphics, and a strong dose of charm coupled with Larian's trademark humor. I've reviewed it in the past and I still recommend it to this day. The sequel Beyond Divinity, however, I am not very fond of. In fact, this may be the worst game in the Divinity franchise. Released in 2004, it retains much of the look and feel of the original, but takes a more direct inspiration from Diablo than its predecessor. Most of the game consists of linear dungeons with rarely any opportunity to explore or even get some fresh air. It is also incredibly buggy, features a worse story, a worse voice cast, but has some great music by Kirill Potrosky once again. Divinity 2 Ego Draconis changes some things in 2009, being an action RPG from a third person perspective. It was also the first time a Divinity game was released for consoles with an Xbox 360 port. I've mainly played the director's cut for the game released in 2012 that includes the Flame of Vengeance expansion pack. While it definitely feels like an RPG of the time, there are some unique elements with it. For one, you are given the ability to mind read NPCs, which can help you discover secrets. There's also segments where you're a dragon, which sounds awesome on paper, but the execution is lacking. Honestly, this game just feels unpolished and I can't get it over 30 frames per second even after removing the frame cap. I just find the game to be boring, but at least it's not as frustrating as Beyond was. Divinity Dragon Commander is one of the more intriguing games that I've played. Released in 2013, this was a hybrid of a crap ton of genres, including real-time strategy games, grand strategy games, dragon combat, politics, and even card games. This had the potential to be an all-time classic, but unfortunately, it needed a bit more time, specifically from the real-time strategy combat side of things. The political game, however, is a ton of fun balancing out what each race wants. There's a ton of political commentary here, but it's actually handled very well by Larian, poking at all sides of the spectrum. I've beaten this game and it definitely deserves its own review. It's just such a shame though that it never lived up to its potential. And that leads us to today's game originally backed by Kickstarter, Divinity Original Sin. It was originally released in 2014 with an enhanced edition upgrade in 2015. There's a ton that took place during and after release, including the aforementioned death of Kirill Potrovsky. Heck, even with the funds provided by Kickstarter, there was a chance this game could have bankrupted Larian if it didn't succeed. Thankfully, it did recouping its losses and generating a profit to eventually start another Kickstarter with Original Sin 2 and then eventually Baldur's Gate 3, which turned out to be one of the greatest games I have ever experienced. I've played the hell out of the Original Sin and played it to completion before, but is it still worth playing today? When you start the game, you are given two characters to control. This is a direct callback to Beyond Divinity and how you had control over both of the characters and can build them in whatever way you wanted. You can pick one of the created classes or completely customize it yourself. For here, I'm going with Robert the Wayfarer and Sapphire the Shadowblade. We will eventually fill out the party with a warrior and a mage, but we will get to the companions later. The opening crawl sets the stage on what Original Sin is mainly based off of, and that is Source. Source is the root of everything and is seen as evil since most sorcerers have gone mad and it is up to two source hunters to help with that problem. The story starts out pretty simple with you investigating the murder of one, but opens up to reveal much more going on in the world. For the overall narrative, Original Sin has a very bad habit of exposition dumping. Every time something happens, a character or two just happens to know why things are the way they are and will dump a ton of information on you. Even learning about your companions is just more layers of information dumped on 
before the next part comes along. It happens far too often and ultimately kills the pacing for the most part. Funny enough, I still found the story to be enjoyable enough despite the poor delivery. The world of Divinity is full of rich lore that has spanned multiple games by this point. I enjoy seeing the recurring characters once again make an appearance, including Arhu and the legendary imp Zigzax. There are even other characters in this game that also make an appearance in Original Sin 2 to make the series feel like it has a cohesive narrative and world. This game also has a great sense of humor and doesn't take itself too seriously, although I do prefer the darker tone of Original Sin 2. Alright, enough about the story and let's begin the game proper. As expected for any Larian RPG, you begin your adventure washed up on a beach. The movement is all done in real time, while combat is done in a turn-based system. It honestly doesn't take long before you reach your first combat encounter. The combat in Original Sin is one that I can talk about for hours on end, but I will keep it as brief as possible. Simply put, it is freaking awesome and was really genre defining, especially for the time. One of the biggest strengths of the combat engine is the synergy of the elements. For example, a fire arrow can be shot in a poison or oil puddle in order to create a larger explosion. This can often cause a chain reaction and can be highly devastating. Another one is casting a lightning bolt on a puddle of water in order to create electrified water, which can stun enemies that are standing on it. It's this level of creativity that helps it stand head and shoulders above other turn-based titles. Even without taking this synergy of elements into consideration, there are still a boatload of strategic options and skills to play with. Each turn you're given a set amount of AP depending on the stats of your characters. Endurance determines maximum AP, while speed determines how many AP points you get per turn. AP is used for both movement and using skills. Potions and scrolls can also be used in order to get yourself out of a jam or to push the advantage. One more positive thing about the skills is the fact that many of them have excellent utility outside of combat. If you see a way that you need to cross that is blocked by fire, a rain spell is the perfect answer to help you with that. If you need to move an ally character to a particular area, a teleportation scroll is just what you need. It's this level of flexibility and creativity that allows for so much experimentation in all facets of the game. If I did have to point to one negative, it's the fact that you can only remember so many skills at a time. Depending on your level for a particular school will determine how many kinds of those skills you can have. For example, skills are separated into novice, adept, and master skills. More often than not, you'll run out of either rookie or adept space and will need to forget the skill in order to add the skill that you want. To put it bluntly, this was an archaic system that I don't remember being part of gameplay since the late 90s. Thankfully, Original Sin 2 had a far better system with the memory system and foregoing the need to forget skills to make room for others. Eventually, we make our way into the town of Sysiel and are able to trade with others as well as begin taking on more quests. I will admit that the game can be overwhelming to a newcomer at this point. There's just so much to do and so many people to talk to that it's not often clear on what you should do first. It's also recommended that you do quests within the city to give yourself enough experience to venture forth. And as you gain experience throughout the adventure, you'll eventually level up. Leveling up can give you an attribute point to increase your stats, ability points to increase your skill level in a particular school, and a talent point to purchase a talent. Talents are basically perks in this game, with many of them being very creative. One of my favorites is Pet Pal, which allows you to talk to animals directly, opening up a crap ton more of possibilities. Since it's recommended to fill out the party, we will need to get two companions to join us. One is a fellow source hunter named Medora, who will fill out the powerhouse role perfectly. And the final slot, I chose the only man for the job. The ultimate demon hunter himself, Jehan. He specializes in air and water magic, which are two schools we were lacking in. Also plan to have Medora increase her intelligence to learn pyromancy in order to give her a bit more tactical flexibility. There are also two more companions in Bartador the Ranger and Wolfcraft the Rogue but I don't have any use for them in this configuration. And honestly, it's hard for me to have a party and not include Jehan. To me, he is easily the most entertaining companion of the bunch. He's just so serious about everything that you end up just laughing at his over the top reactions to what is going around him. He is one character that I was actually pretty happy to see again in Original Sin 2. 
Outside of combat and puzzles, there is a ton of dialogue as previously mentioned. One unique mechanic is how persuasion works. You can either pick intimidate, charm, or reason. Each will work better with certain characters than others. You then go into a battle of rock, paper, scissors and will need to win in order to persuade the character. This allows for characters with even low persuasion to get some sort of shot without having to reach a certain number. It can even happen between your two characters which is a ton of fun when playing multiplayer. This unfortunately was not brought back in Original Sin 2, but I ultimately understand why. It can feel a bit jarring to play a game of this even when you have high persuasion. There's also a personality mechanic that is determined by what your characters say during certain situations. Depending on what their personality is will give them bonuses that can be helpful to them. Unfortunately, it isn't very clear on what personality traits this will influence with a certain answer, so it comes across as a bit vague. I was initially sad to see it removed in Original Sin 2, but honestly, the game was better off without it. For the music, what can I say besides this being one of Kirill Prokrovsky's finest works? He was always an experimental composer, mixing both traditional melodies with non-traditional instruments, and Original Sin is no exception. The soundtrack even features some tracks from prior titles, which surprisingly do not feel out of place at all. It really is as if the world of Rivalon is speaking to us through the melody, and it was something that only Prokhorovsky knew how to convey. His legacy lives on through the unforgettable soundtrack, a testament to his abilities to create music that resonates with the hearts of players and adds an enduring magic to the gaming experience. Rest in peace, Mr. Prokhorovsky, and thank you for all of your hard work and dedication to your craft. All right, and now that I've poured my heart out, let's wrap up the rest of this review. Graphically, the game was fine for the time, but is definitely starting to show its age. Compared to Original Sin 2 and to Baldur's Gate 3, the graphics come across as cartoonish and not very polished. This is fine, however, given the year this was released and the lower budget compared to the other two titles. I've mentioned this prior, but this game does feature online multiplayer, as well as split screen co-op with another buddy. Playing any Larian RPG with a friend is an unforgettable experience, and Original Sin is no exception. Overall, I can still recommend Original Sin, although Original Sin 2 and Baldur's Gate 3 are far superior titles in my opinion. With that said, the combat is still a ton of fun, the lore is great as always, and the music is nothing short of magnificent. I'm ultimately glad that Original Sin was successful enough to help spawn two more amazing RPGs worth playing over and over again. What makes Original Sin 1 feel inferior is the archaic need to forget skills, the lack of good pacing, and the overall production values being less than later titles. Still, it is worth a playthrough for Jehan's antics alone. Thank you guys for watching as always, and this is Powerhouse, signing off. Thank you.